ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third annual National Republican Congressional Committee event with President George Bush. I'm Ken Keyes, Chairman of the President's Forum of the National Republican Congressional Committee, and a number of the President's Forum members are here today. I'd like to welcome them all here and to thank them for everything that they have done for the National Republican Congressional Committee. In particular, I'd like to recognize Tom Burnham of Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Tom Nimitt of New York who have done a yeoman work with respect to this event today and ask them to stand and give them a round of applause. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Our special guests on the dais today. Spence Abraham on my far left is the co-chairman of the National Republican Congressional Committee. He assumed that role earlier this year after the President of the United States, what makes today even more special for me is that I'm able to bring you not only the leader of the free world, but also a human being of great warmth, charm, good humor, and grace. I first met the President when he was Republican National Committee Chairman in 1973. I remember then that he virtually radiated leadership. Since then, we've all come to know him as a quiet yet determined man a principled yet practical negotiator, and a disciplined yet caring neighbor. And even though she isn't here, I must say that with all those other awesome qualities, we also know, based upon the woman that he married, that he has great taste in women. Uh, please tell Barbara that we're thinking of her today, and uh, I would like to say that I think she's probably the warmest, least pretentious, most sincere woman I know, and that America, in my view, has never had in the past, nor are we likely to have in the future, a more perfect First Lady. George Bush is a gentle man, leading by the force of his convictions, who in just his first term has reshaped this world into a new order with the watchwords of freedom and democracy. He stood firm against aggression, guided our troops to victory, but he's also the man who's shown us that a thousand points of light exist not just in some theory, but also in the vast expanse of his own heart. If there's one person who can lead us to prosperity, guide America into the uncharted reaches of the next century, my friends, George Bush is that man. Please join me in welcoming President George Bush. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Thanks for the welcome. Barbara, thank you. Thank you very, very much. How are you doing? Thank you all. Please be seated. And Barbara, Barbara, thank you so much for that warm introduction and those very generous comments, certainly about me, but especially about uh, Barbara Bush. Uh, and congratulations on this highly successful luncheon. 
uh, to Ken Keyes, the chairman of the President's Forum. We salute you, sir, and thank you for your dedicated work. Uh, I'd like also to salute Guy Vanderjack and, yes, Carol. Uh, Guy is steadfast in his support, leadership of the NRCC, and is, continues to do a great job. Uh, also, I'd like to single out uh, another son of Michigan, Spencer Abraham over here, uh, and Jane, his wife, who's with us. And it's ex exciting to see all of you, especially uh, the elected Republican members of the House of Representatives. Uh, I want to thank each of you for your support of this congressional committee. It is vital work. We got lots to do uh, in the 11 months that lie ahead. This is the third straight year, I believe, Guy, that I've participated in the, this event that's sponsored by the uh, NRCC. And the first honored that great son of Illinois, uh, our House Republican leader, Bob Michael. And last year, we honored the ranking Republican members of the House. And today, we honor all the men and women who are all first among equals, every single a Republican member of the House of Representatives. And to those of you here who do not happen to be members of the House of Representatives, just putting up the money for this lunch and to support this committee, let me tell you, we have an outstanding group of Republicans in the House, and my firm desire is that we have many, many more. Now a pledge, I'm not gonna speak very long. You have to get back to your jobs, and I have to get back to my reading. Uh, recently, I began Mikhail Gorbachev's book about the overthrow in Moscow. And of course, the book I'm really waiting for is about the overthrow in the New Jersey legislature. <laughs> I, because, because I'm here to say today, New Jersey, tomorrow, the United States Congress. Of course, You know and I know that the Democrats won't just roll over and that we're going to have to take our fight uh, and our issues uh, to the people. But the times are right and our policies are right. And Americans want to free themselves from the tired old ideas of the liberal elite and get a chance to make the American dream a reality in the workplace, at home, in the schools, and on the streets. So let's talk today just about a few of the issues that separate Republicans from the other party. First, the economy. For more than a decade, we Republicans have worked to create growth and opportunity and prosperity, and we presided over the longest peacetime expansion in American history. Since, 18, since 1981, you know the figures, 17 million new jobs, and yet a record, a good one, is not something to rest upon. It's something to build upon. And we have to take common sense steps to get this economy moving again. Look, people are hurting out there. Uh, and our approach, if Congress would have acted, would have alleviated that hurt. There is no question in my mind about that. And as you might know, our long-term growth strategy is founded on several elements. First, we know that we got to get that deficit down. We got a budget agreement that puts the squeeze on federal spending, and I want to see us abide by it. It is the only protection that the taxpayer has to control domestic spending. And we got to keep inflation under control. Frankly, it's doing pretty well right now. And we got to sustain the policies that help bring interest rates to these historic lows. But we've also got to keep American business competitive. And that means slashing red tape and regulations wherever possible. Dan Quayle is doing a superb job in trying, and we all need to support him in this fight against excessive regulation. I'm trying to hold the line, and you're supporting me on this, against government mandates 
that handcuffed the American entrepreneur. Competitiveness. That means real tort reform. Capping these obscene liability awards that are driving American business to its knees. And we've got to get that through the United States Congress. And of course we've got to make good on a sound commitment that we have to quality education and to job training to ensure a workforce ready for the challenges that this new century or just over the horizon will bring. And finally, we've got to make certain American businesses compete on an equal footing. And that means a government committed to the principles of free and fair trade. Uh, we've taken the free trade message to Japan and to the European community and closer to home. Uh, thanks to the support of many, many in this room, we've won fast-track authority for the North American Free Trade Agreement linking the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And I am convinced we get a good agreement. That means jobs for the American worker. And I reject unequivocally the quicksand of protectionism turning inward into a world of isolation when the markets lie abroad in profuse numbers. Instead, you see, our forward-looking initiatives can create new markets for American products and new jobs for Americans. I'm confident our long-term strategy is on target. But there are steps we've got to take right now. We begin with the overhaul of our antiquated financial system, our antiquated banking system. Every one of you knows how the problems uh, in our banking system plague the economy. So in March, I sent to Congress the first comprehensive bank reform since the 1930s. And it's time, and we've had good support, may I say to those not in Congress here, from the members of Congress on the Republican side and the banking committee there, it's time, though, that the Congress enacts real reform. This would help in the credit markets and would help instantly. Uh, the same goes for other key proposals. Uh, for th three years now, I've proposed a package of growth initiatives shaped by many of you in this room. Not just capital gains that I've strongly supported, talked about every single speech I give. Not just that one, but incentives to encourage saving like our family savings accounts, increased in, in incentives to, uh, for research and development, R&D, to help keep American business competitive, measures to help first-time buyers tap into their IRAs to buy that new home. That would help instantly. Enterprise zones to unleash the urban entrepreneur. Each one of these initiatives help the economy. And no one knows better than all of us uh, the state of the economy. I've seen it in people's eyes, felt it in their hurt, and where Americans are hurting, all of us must be concerned and must try to help. And I know what the loss of a job can mean to a person's dreams, what it means to lives. And so I was pleased uh, to reach an agreement with Congress on uh, working out an extension to the unemployment benefits to people who are in need. And we got this done, as Leader Michael knows, Newt over here knows, by vetoing the Democrats' budget-busting approach and finally getting legislation that helps people and still honors the taxpayer by holding the line on the, on the budget agreement. And and once again, to get good legislation, I had to rely on the people in this room to beat bound bad legislation before we could get it. Uh, those successful on this, unemployment benefits and others, too many of the initiatives that we were elected to, uh, to achieve disappear into the Beltway's vision of the Bermuda Triangle. Capitol Hill. Since, since 1955, Democrats have controlled the House. And for 30 of the last 36 years, 
They've controlled the Senate as well. And they've all too often forgotten something very fundamental, that federal money isn't their money, it's your money, the taxpayers' money, and they don't seem to know. As I said in my inaugural address, Americans didn't send us here to bicker, they sent us here to act. And so today again, I challenge the Congress, particularly the Democratic leadership, to pass our growth incentives. Democrats think prosperity stems from growth of government, and we believe it comes from the growth of opportunity. And all of this reminds me of that old joke, you know what you get when you play country music backwards? You get your job back, your dog back, and your wife back. Well, well, well you, know, you know what you get when you throw the Democrats out of Congress? You get your job back, your pride back, and your country back. So, No, you don't have to look far to understand that the American people want a change. The problem is that on crucial business, Congress isn't leading or following, it's just sitting there. The Democratic leaders are prohibiting our agenda from coming, to the, coming for a vote even. So here's the solution. Get Congress moving again by electing Republican majorities to the House and the Senate. Seems very simple to me, and if we do our job right next year, I think it'll be clear to the American people. I don't believe we've ever had a better opportunity in the last 30 years than we do in 1992. And nowhere is that more true than when it comes to our domestic agenda. I'm getting a little tired. Liberals say that we don't have one, and what they mean is we are not willing to accept their agenda. And I'll tell you a secret. We never will have their agenda as long as I'm President of the United States. We are going to continue to veto this bad legislation and hopefully pass good legislation. The stall strategy, it's gone long, long, long enough. And listen to these facts. Members here know them, but I'll click them off for the rest of y'all. I mentioned banking reform on March 20th. March 20th. Sent legislation to Congress. That was 244 days ago. No bill. On March 11th, I sent Congress crime legislation to take the hoods off the street and give a little protection to the police officer out there. That was 253 days ago. No bill. On March 4th, I sent up energy legislation, 260 days ago, no bill. On February 13th, up went our transportation legislation, 279 days later, you guessed it, no bill. And for two years, I've prodded Congress to pass our Educational Excellence Act, and for the last six months, our America 2000 program. We all know that America's schools aren't, aren't making the grade, and so there's only one answer. Elect more Republicans so that Congress won't continue to flunk the test. And today I'm going to have to veto the Labor HHS Appropriations Bill. My directive, already implemented by Secretary Lee Sullivan, assures that there is nothing to prevent a woman from receiving complete medical information about her condition from a physician. In other words, we have taken care of the insidious charge that we are trying to gag a woman and her doctor. We throwing out these revised legislations is, is throwing out the these revised regulations is not the way to go. And I hope I can count again on the support from the members of Congress here today to sustain that veto and get us a good bill that we all can support. But the problem with Democrats in Congress isn't just 
the domestic agenda. It's their determination to live in the last century instead of focusing on the next. Their short-sightedness about our foreign policy achievements proves the point. Most liberals never met a defense cut they didn't like. And Republicans, on the other hand, know that a strong defense can help keep the peace. I'm very pleased with the way the world has moved towards freedom, towards peace. But there's still a lot of trouble spots out there, and nobody can predict with ultimate clarity what's going to happen in some of these developing parts of the world. Think of the Liberal Democrats over the last 20 years. They were wrong about peace through strength. We didn't win the Cold War by following the liberal defense agenda. We won it because we stood four square behind a simple idea, freedom, and backed it up with muscle. And now we're in a new era. And as I say, it is a more hopeful era, but not one without challenges. And this could not have been more clearly demonstrated than in the Persian Gulf. And I can assure you, had we followed the Democrats' advice, I really believe this, Saddam Hussein would be in Saudi Arabia as I stand before you speaking today. But, but here's the point, the tune hasn't changed. They act as if Americans had no stake in the rest of the world. The history of this century has shown time and again how wrong isolationism is, and in today's interdependent world, it leads to folly, if not worse. I couldn't help but been slightly annoyed, understatement of the year, when I heard one of you all's colleagues, in this instance a liberal Democrat from the state of Michigan, who I will not name, uh, as I was opening this historic conference in Madrid, bringing, peace, bringing people together that nobody ever dreamed would come and sit in the same room, looking across the room and seeing the Israelis and the Jordanians and the Syrians and Palestinian delegation all coming together for the first time, thanks to the hard work of our administration, particularly our secretary, and then hear some carping criticism from some little guy out there who's saying I shouldn't even be over there convening that peace conference. I am not going to turn this country inward and forget that we are the leader of the free world and we're going to remain the leader, the moral leader for freedom around the world. And they can note that one down. You see, See, I, I look at it this way. When we work to beat back economic isolationism, protectionism, to create more American jobs and economic growth, that isn't just foreign policy. It's good for the American people right here at home. And when drugs threatened our neighborhoods and our families, I went down to Colombia uh, to protect the lives of our children. Stemming the tide of drugs doesn't just benefit the globe. It helps the United States of America. And incidentally, our drug strategy is working. Thanks to Bob Martinez and Bill Bennett before him, we're making real headway on that fight. And I'm going to continue to probe this administration, keep them going, keep them on track with Congress, working to beat down this menace of drugs. Drug use is down, and now let's get it further down. And and then again, when, when, when a tyrant invaded Kuwait, Yes, we helped liberate a land, and I'm proud of those troops, and they made ours a better world, and they also, in the process, in my view, made America even, uh, an even better place. There's a Texas saying, dance with the one who brung you, and our policies have helped bring America peace and democracy undreamt of in human history. So let's take this message to America. We don't demagogue. We deliver. We don't posture. We produce. And with your su support, we can produce a great victory for Republicans and for America. Thank you. So thank you very much for your prayers. 
we believe in that. The longer I'm in this job, we sure do believe in that. Uh, and together, let's do even more in the months ahead. Let's set off our own revolution in 1992 and usher in a new era of new ideas and real solutions. So let's make 1992 the year of the Republican so that we can kick off a total age of opportunity. Thank you all for this fantastic support to you members. Thank you for your support. And may God bless you all in our great country. Thank you.